play. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we're, okay. we're we're not so used to all these fancy things. What's going on? Yeah, I, I you know I had a old PowerPoint presentation about ten years ago, and a master gardener said you need to dress this up a little bit. You so. did. You just you exceeded my expectations. Let me tell you. Yeah. So. Um, well, let me introduce you, Doug. This is Dr. Doug Caldwell, who soon will be retiring, but um, oh. as he does his. Uh, uh, finale here. He's uh, a commercial horticulture agent in Collier County, constantly busy with insects and diseases that affect commercial yeah. plantings and et cetera, et cetera. He's often the person that finds the first new bug or new disease wow. as it enters his uh, territory. And so he gets all the fun with that. But uh, he uh, uh, was formerly with Davy Tree, I guess, years ago, uh -huh. and has been here uh, an extension uh, 20 years or so. so 19 he's... years, four months. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not well... counting. <laughs> <laughs> so he's well-versed in all this type of uh, stuff, and so he's always interesting. And whenever he goes to like a, like a, a, a meeting or a conference, He's often immediately looking at the landscaping of the hotel and looking for problems and pests and taking pictures and such. So that's a, a nice little quirky thing about him. Um, I will say that um, uh, I'm going to have to bolt out soon to another Zoom meeting. Sorry about that. But Paul is in control. He is the master cylinder, and he will be helping with all that type of stuff. So are we recording? Um, Yes, so, it is recording. Yep, Paul's we'll getting a recording. And I will also say that, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, oh, that if everybody can mute themselves uh, while Doug's talking, then we will. Uh, uh, so, Doug, we usually go like 50 minutes. We take a bio break or whatever, you know, uh -huh. and address questions and such. Um, but are oh. you talking from home? I am. You are. Very good. So are we using uh, the questions and answers or the... Uh... Um, you can let them at the end uh, uh, of each section. Maybe you can just take questions verbally. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's kind of nice to have... What's the other uh, option? Well, chat. 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 You, they could put stuff in chat too, sure. I don't see chat though. But um, so I've got... An hour and a half or so? Or... Yeah, you got to from now till 1230 or less. Okay, so nobody's going to be upset if it's less then. <laughs> no, because <laughs> all your time <laughs> is enriched beyond what us normal people are able to present. So. <laughs> Ralph, you should have your own radio show. You look natural there. I, I know. I just feel like, uh, you know, somebody. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Doug Caldwell. Yay. Thanks, Ralph. Okay, uh, so do I need to do something? So it's just, uh, I'm side by side with the presentation. Yep, you're fine. I'm fine. All right, I guess everybody can adjust it on their own screen too. Well, greetings everybody. And uh, I find insects a lot more exciting than diseases, but we'll <laughs> We'll get into that as to why you need to know, uh, what you need to know, uh, especially we like to have people on the front lines at the plant clinics. And we have about, I think four or five, and I think Charlotte I had even uh, eight or so years ago. So you guys are into the plant clinics early. So that's where we need our uh, top diagnosticians. So with that in mind, that's, that's where we're gonna, head off into. Um, so for as far as the insect portion, was that, how did you guys play the uh, presentation I gave or? I believe that they att uh, attended the recording of you. Yep. The recording yeah. or at, was it live? No, it wasn't live. It was the recording, I'm pretty sure. Okay, hope yep. that worked out. So, when I moved down here from Ohio, I had to get familiar with uh, the common insects and diseases and plants. I'd had experience down to Tampa 
uh, in Sarasota with, I will confess, I did work with Kim Lon from 1980 to 1986, and then Davy Tree from, uh, for 13 years. So after that, so I traveled quite a bit and saw a lot of different nice landscapes from uh, Seattle to Cape Cod to uh, New Orleans to uh, as far south as I got Florida was Tampa and Sarasota. And when I got down here, it's like, wow, this is way different than Sarasota. So we're semi-tropical and we have a whole lot of different plants and uh, that's what makes it invigorating is to uh, learn about these new plants, new insects, and new, z new diseases. Ah, elementary, my dear Watson. Purely elementary. <laughs> so I don't know if you can hear some of these uh, sound effects. So one of the more common issues we have besides diseases and insects is people abuse to trees. And... Uh, we often see plants installed incorrectly or plants installed. No, nobody goes back to see how the support systems are doing. And uh, this was a jacaranda. There was about five of them and they left the support system, the boards, two by four boards uh, in place. You can see where the, it's, this is strange. <laughs> I can't point at it and show you. So you see those indentations, that's where the metal bands supported wrapped around and supported the post which this burlap wrapped piece of wood is a post and they, they never removed them so the tree just kept growing around them i'm surprised that it's even alive but i don't think it's going to live through many high wind events so taking care of those supports by removing them a year or so after planting very important Oh, and here's one that showed up uh, as far as looking at things that we're not familiar with. This is giant milkweed. And uh, actually, this is my boss's giant milkweed, and she thought she had scale problems on it. And it's actually a rust. For those of you that have uh, butterfly gardens, I've never seen it in mine. It also gets on the normal, well, everyday milkweed that we use with the uh, orange yellow flowers. Um, but I've never seen a bit. So that's something to be on the lookout for. And uh, it's, it, she thought it was scale insect, but it was actually rust. So the best thing you can do is just remove those infected leaves. And I was mentioning uh, not only moving from a new location, but also just in order to be a, a, a skilled diagnostician, there's several subject areas you have to be familiar with. And I look at it as holding up a, a table. So uh, you gotta know your plant ID, which you guys have been through a lot of that recently, I guess. Uh, abiotic problems that can happen. Abiotic being non-living uh, causes such as fertilizer or weather related. We'll cover some of those. Uh, you gotta know your insects, common insects, key insect pests. It's good to know beneficials too. And then the other thing, uh, besides disease, diseases, this is probably like a, an eight-legged table, but I, I kept adding things you need to know. Uh, I tend to forget about nematodes, and, and that's a huge issue down here as opposed to uh, the Midwest, where we have real soil, with, which uh, sort of suppresses nematode growth and development. So. Nematodes do quite well in our sandy soils, unfortunately. So as you acquire this knowledge, you may achieve the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, level of a diagnostician par excellence, a highly sought after moniker, and uh, highly respected in the master gardener realm. So that's what we're gonna head to. And this is cocoa plum, and I see this on uh, other plants, usually lower branches in shady areas. And I was riding with a technician on uh, his truck doing his route, and he said, I, I gotta show you this scale insect I've got on this cocoa plum. I've been spraying insecticides on it, and uh, 
turns out it's he's wasting his time and uh, putting stuff in the environment that he shouldn't be. So this is uh, actually a type of lichen. Um, and uh, it's also a, an alga. So it's it's not real damaging and it's usually on the lower older leaves in the in the shady areas of plants but the key thing is don't be using a an insecticide if you haven't identified the pest problem that's the first step identify the problem and it kind of makes a cool uh screen saver but So we're talking about uh, diseases which are huh, contagious. Remember, this was made 10 years ago. So uh, abiotic problems are not contagious. So as I mentioned, things abiotic problems include fertilizer, lack of fertilizer, wet, soggy soils, cold weather, things like that. Yeah, so when I went to uh, Purdue University in majoring in entomology, I was surprised to learn uh, with my little experience that uh, plants get diseases and you go, well, what, like chicken pox or what kind of diseases do plants get? I'd never been uh, exposed to that arena. So looking down here, this is a uh, strangler figs, a common it's like a tar spot, if you're familiar with uh, that on Norway maples up north, but you'll see a, a similar pathogen. It's, it can only attack older leaves, and it's, it's not really that damaging, but you could get questions on it in the plant, plant clinics. And uh, you get an extra 10 points on your quiz if you can pronounce the genus of this uh, fungal leaf spot. I think it's Ophidiothella, but uh, I just call it tar leaf spot. And part of uh, being a diagnostician is being able to recognize a plant when it's in trouble. And if you get familiar with the plants in your area, you can do a, a lot of even drive-by diagnosing, looking at plants that are definitely off color or not growing well. So you want to always have that in the back of your mind. So the first quiz is, uh, does anybody know? And of course, we're going to have problems doing this. So uh, I'll just, if so Ralph, I want to ask him what's going on here. How uh, can they answer on the chat? Or D-mic? <laughs> Un-mic, that is? Yeah, mic or answer on the chat, either way. Yeah, if I see the chat pop up, I don't see the chat on my end. Ralph's doing his emails, I think. Uh, it's right next to the uh, share screen, uh, to the left. I see participants, I don't see the, ch the chat. And I've used the chat a lot uh, over the last couple of months. But anyway. On mine, at the bottom, it's right next to the participants. If you kind of hover over the bottom, I don't know if it's in the same place on yours. Yeah, it's weird. It's always in that area. Paul, Ralph, where'd my chat go? Anyway, does anybody know this plant? This is a snow bush and uh, it's got various colors. Like there's a rosy and colored with pink and then uh, you get the stippled look. You see, you're supposed to say, oh, that's spider mite or thrips damage, Doug. Everybody knows that. But no, it's uh, normal variegate, variegation on uh, a healthy plant. And slide B is um, plumbago on older leaves. Not all of them, but a certain percent of them will develop these uh, residues, it looks like spray residue or disease, and it's actually uh, chalky glands, chalk glands where they excrete calcium. So it, it looks like a disease, but it's not. So it's getting familiar with what is common in your area. So 
So what is a healthy plant? So knowing your main species and its characteristics, uh, some of the variables, size, twig growth, elongation, is it normal or is it real stubby and short? Uh, leaf size, same thing. Habit, shape or form. Color, is it nice vibrant dark green or off green? And then is flower production compromised, reduced, or more than normal? So uh, the disease triangle, you may have heard of that. Um, and this is really important uh, in depending uh, if a disease is going to develop or not. So what you have to have is a virulent host. And then you have the pathogen. And then you have to have the right environment. And the one handout I gave you has uh, time as a, to make it into a disease pyramid. There's, there's other different angles you can incorporate, but the biggest factor uh, is the environment. Found something? I think so. I've identified the death music, Watson. The melody Miss Brandon. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but uh, anyway, so off we go diagnosing in the. Uh, landscape. So what do we expect to see that might indicate a disease? Uh, leaf spots, abscission meaning leaf drop, wilt, cankers, exudation, that means uh, looking at things dripping where they shouldn't be. Cankers could do that as well as uh, lesions on twigs some kind of injuries and uh, easy ones die back or twig death okay so this is where you have to uh, show us your knowledge and write down common shrub diseases so if you have any time death I'm a in your home landscape or your master gardener experience. So can uh, again, this is gonna be a little difficult, but uh, think of three common shrub diseases and write them down. And uh, if we don't talk about it, we'll get to it. Just trying to, this is audience participation in a virtual world, it's uh, kind of limited. So looking at uh, how many people have avocados, there's a common leaf spot disease. You can you see the spotting there. Uh, some have associated it with the avocado lace bug. You can see the black spotting uh, and then see these little guys here. I think uh, you can see my arrow there, Ralph. You see my arrow moving? <laughs> Maybe he's doing a grant. Anyway, uh, looking at the adult lace bugs here. So the black tar spots are the uh, excrement from the lace bugs. But anyway, they think that uh, because of the, as you recall, homoptera have piercing sucking mouth parts, that uh, they create a portal of entry for the spores that didn't show up the way it's supposed to. Oh, I can't see it because it's hidden under my uh, zoom controls. So, the feeding with the piercing second mouth, mouth parts creates a, a wound or a portal of entry that the, the fungus can enter into the plant tissues. Some other powdery mildews, you're probably familiar with rose powdery mildew and that uh, depends a whole lot on the rose cultivar. So looking at IPM or, or pest management, disease pest management, the variety or cultivar plays a huge role in uh, some of these diseases, especially roses with black spot and powdery mildew. Now, the, the flower on the right is a mango flower, and they can get powdery mildews, and that will decrease fruit production. And a ra rather new disease, well, it wasn't here for the first 10 years I was here, and then it just kind of exploded overnight is the um, downy mildew on um, mirror, mirror leaf, awabuki, viburnum. 
And I think we have two diseases here. There's a, also an uh, anthracnose leaf spot. Uh, so you see the spotting. I think, in fact, this is the anthracnose, and the downy mildew is coming up in the next slide. And this leaf on the right, you see the chlorosis and the leaf spot. And that tends to happen more during the summer, whereas the downy mildew is uh, more of a cool season like the first cool temperatures in November. So here's a Awabuki hedge, it's pretty much defoliated. This is 2011 when it, it just seemed to come out of nowhere. It wasn't a uh, import new disease, but uh, it was known to be in the neighborhood, so to speak. Just didn't have the right disease triangle conditions for it to explode. And of course, uh, we have YouTube videos, uh, Doug Bug himself. If you go to YouTube and then look for Doug Bug himself, the Doug Bug himself channel, we have about 30 some videos on common landscape, insect diseases and pruning issues that the uh, new arrival from the Midwest should uh, just get some popcorn and watch those before they start gardening. So the downy mildew disease is more of a blotch disease. It'll affect uh, larger areas. Again, you can see that a lot of defoliation in the background there. And you zero in, you can see the, uh, it's, I'll call it mycelial growth. It's the growth of the, uh, the downy mildew, which is not a fungus. So um, we'll talk about that later. But a lot of people try to use fungicides to control this, and being it's a water mold and not a fungus, it's a whole lot different to control. It's very difficult to control once it gets a foothold. So you have to be preventive on these. Uh, another common disease we see on, uh, hey, these things actually have flowers. If you, if you lay off the pruning uh, into little gum gumdrops, They'll have these fragrant flowers, so that's a uh, Japanese ligustrum. And it gets a uh, anthracnose leaf spot disease, usually again, older leaves in the canopy in the shade, but recently it seems like, uh, and Cercospora is a genus uh, in that anthracnose group. So you see these yellow spots and def leaf, leaf defoliation. Usually it's pretty minor and not that big a deal. There's a close up. Another common leaf spot disease is angular leaf spot on uh, Pittosporum. And this is a, Pittosporum is more of an old fashioned popular plant. It's, it's not used as much, but, and that's what happens. We see it on the older plantings once they get like, 15, 20 years old, they tend to be more vulnerable to this, uh, and this is a Cercospora fungal leaf spot. You can apply various fungicides, but it's probably just better to rip them out and put something new in. This one can be a fool or two. If you like Angel's Trumpet, uh, this is my Angel's Trumpet. I tend to get holes in it during the winter um, by this uh, fungal leaf, we call it shot hole disease. And it's usually leaves in the shady areas under canopy. Again, cooler weather seems to favor its development. It's not that big a deal, but people could bring these leaves into the plant clinic and they say, something's chewing on my angel's trumpet. And uh, I've been applying pesticides for the last two years or something crazy but so one thing we want to do with proper diagnosing is end up using the right pesticide and if it's needed and managing the problem so that the problem is not causing damage and here's where you see the fungus will move into the leaf tissue and then as it spreads throughout the mesophyll cells there they eventually dry out and drop out, dry out and drop out. So again, that's more of a wintertime disease. 
And this is a, a, a plant that really should not be used in our semi-tropical environment. This is Indian hawthorn, and uh, you can see the leaf spotting is pretty severe, uh, defoliation. And what I tell people uh, to help with the diagnosing is they might bring some leaves in and it's not real evident. Uh, Stephen Brown's done some work. I think he's got a, a publication on these anthracnose leaf spots as well as uh, leaf spots, a separate publication on Indian hawthorn leaf spots. There's probably three or four more types of fungi that'll cause leaf spots, but you can put the leaves, affected leaves in a Ziploc bag. And then, uh, this is a high-tech growth chamber using a Ziploc bag. Uh, see what happens in four or five days. And uh, I pulled the leaves out and we had these, what we call erumpent fruiting bodies that were classic for uh, Intimosporium leaf spot. If anybody's familiar with uh, Fotenia, say up in the Atlanta, a little farther north, that was a limiting factor for Fotenia. It would totally destroy uh, the red tip Fotenia shrubs. So we always like to look at, uh, are there resistant varieties? And, uh, okay, so here's what came out of those little erumpent spore tendrils. The spores are kind of uh, unique. Usually spores are just like football shaped or circular, spherical and uh, not too exciting, very difficult to separate out one disease from another. But uh, some plant pathologists thought these intimosporum spores resembled an insect. So they're a little cooler looking than most spores. And so he gave it the name of uh, intimosporum, entomology, bug looking spores. Uh, now, so okay, this is from Auburn, I believe, Auburn in Alabama, Auburn University, looking at resistant varieties of Indian hawthorns. Indian hawthorns are best grown in Arizona, I think. They're more of a dry weather Mediterranean type plant. So we try to grow them down here where we get, what, 50, 60 inches of rainfall. Uh, they're not real happy, especially if they're in the shade or in the irrigation. But if you insist, uh, and there's these varieties. Now, trying to find the labels in nurseries, I, I must say I don't think I've seen a named variety of Indian hawthorn. There's, the labeling seems to be uh, deficient. Um, and here's some of the, the susceptible varieties. And uh, those should be uh, legible on your handouts if you printed those or received those from Ralph but I don't recommend Indian Hawthorne. Uh, Cause yeah, besides the rainfall, we're usually sticking them in under the shade of the oak tree or where the irrigation is gonna hit them and that's gonna make uh, the disease worse. So looking at leaf spots, and it, you know, when I first moved down here, I, uh, property we moved to had uh, a classic uh, three queen palms on each corner and uh, a hedge or two of exoras. So, and I see these spots during the winter time, November, December. I'm going, oh, that must be the uh, intensporium leaf spot. But no, uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the university professors had done some work on this. And don't be wasting your fungicides and contaminating the environment. Uh, you're not going to help. So this is strictly nutritional. So it's macro defi macronutrient deficiency, potassium and uh, ph phosphorus. So this is research done by uh, Dr. Tim. And what we find during the, uh, Tim Broshot that is, sorry, uh, during the winter when we have less root activity, less nutrient uptake, uh, we'll get this spotting. And it can make the uh, hedge pretty thin and ratty looking. 
So you need to get some extra nutrients in there, uh, say October, September, even earlier. And there's also a cool video on uh, YouTube, Dr. Doug Bug himself, on uh, this Exora issue. We also try to acidify the soil by adding cottonseed meal, pine straw, iron sulfate. The more organic matter you can add to improve the uh, character of the soil, the better uh, it will help with this condition. Okay, so check that out. Also beware of your local fertilizer uh, regulations because phosphorus is the one we want to uh, uh, only use if we need to. That can be a, a big issue if it gets into the water, surface water systems. Eugenia rust, uh, another wintertime disease. We see this on uh, Australian brush cheria and uh, other Eugenias. And you'll see it's, it's severe enough you get twig dieback young twig die back and you get all this spotting. So actually it's kind of like a free pruning, a bio pruning by a, a rust disease. It might look a little ugly, but you can probably skip a pruning cycle. Okay, some rust diseases have alternative hosts, but we don't know about the, this guava rust, I believe is the fine formal name, and again, Stephen Brown did an excellent fact sheet on this. And uh, here it is on Simpson Stopper on the fruit. And you people know, know how the mockingbirds like their Simpson Stopper fruit without spores on it, right? So. Another very common wintertime disease is the frangipani rust disease. And actually, you can probably see some rust starting now, but it really explodes in November, December, and causes leaf drop. People argue that it's not that big a deal, that uh, uh, the pomeria do that, the frangipanis do that. Um, but if you could stop that uh, leaf drop, we found with some uh, certain apple scab cultivars up in the Midwest, if we could stop the apple scab leaf drop, we got really big, uh, bigger flowering, huge flowering the next spring uh, with certain cultivars, if you control that uh, leaf spot, fungal leaf spot disease. So uh, my hypothesis is you could probably do the same with the fang frangipani rust disease. So uh, there's some recommendations on that uh, later. Uh, and here's a, uh, will work, a real workhorse in the landscape is uh, Glaucus senna or senna suratensis. Of course, they haven't looked like this for uh, about eight years or so. They flower pretty much year round when they're healthy. But it also goes by the moniker, uh, the yellow blowover senna. So these tend to be one, a shrub naturally, but we try to develop them into a, a small tree, which also tends to get top heavy. So this is after, uh, I think it was a jaguar went by at 40 miles an hour. Boom, over they go. Actually, I think it was a tropical storm, but anyway, you can see they're just not meant to be a, a good standard tree. Maybe after 10 years and you keep the canopy thin, but the main problem with it now, and I don't recommend using them, is because of this, uh, this rust disease. And again, we have another uh, YouTube video on that, I'll give you more information. Uh, this is a real extreme rust disease because not only do you get the the leaf spotting, leaf drop, but it invades the twig tissue and you get terminal dieback. So you can see here where the terminals are dying. 
And it makes the trees look real ugly. Okay, and another thing we found out with these glaucosinas is because they blow over, people try to prop them up, and again, they don't come back and remove the hardware or the ropes, twine, that they were so concerned about propping the trees up and giving them that tender, loving care, but they don't come back to check on them and remove the encumbrances that choke the trees to death. And that's how we should be training our landscape crews. It's not they go in and hard prune, hard shear the fire bush in this particular bed every three months. It's like nobody recognized, hey, there's another problem here. So uh, training the landscape crews and people that are out, out there looking to uh, be cognizant of other things that could happen is very important to a landscape maintenance company. Uh, holly spheropsis on Dahoon hollies. So you see the swelling here on this new growth. And we also have another problem in that uh, we've got sooty mold. So I'm sure somebody was going to point that out. So we also have green scale, which is a soft scale. And as you recall, green scale, we talked about that as, and being a soft scale produces honeydew. And if we have honeydew, we get sooty mold growing on the sugars in the honeydew. So this holly spheropsis, uh, the fungus invades the young tender twig tissue and causes it to uh, proliferate. You get sort of a candelabra kind of effect. Look to it, stunted swollen growth. And you get die back and, and uh, trees eventually will die. It's very hard to control. You can try pruning, but this seems to be uh, something that's coming out of nurseries due to poor propagation techniques. So you wanna uh, check your plants before you bring them home as always. And we'd see this spheropsis gall on oleanders. On, again, uh, it's older plants. They seem to be struggling. And uh, the fungus invades here, and it shuts off the flow of nutrients. This is actually to the left. It goes down to the twigs and branches. So this is the top part here. And the nutrients get stuck here. And the plant uh, basically starves to death over time. So it's nothing you can do other than rip it out and start over. Now, uh, slash pine uh, has typically had uh, a common disease called pitch canker, and it usually will attack the new growth. And if you catch it early, it's almost like somebody poured glue clear glue, uh, almost, should I say, snot-like running down that candle or terminal. But uh, 2011 or so, I have to check my notes, sorry. So we would get, die, we had dieback of these uh, large pines and it was uh, just underneath the new growth. So it wasn't the new growth. So uh, to distinguish the pitch canker, again, we'll take the top out, the candle out, and you'll have a lot of resin exudate. Uh, the diplodia starts lower beneath the new growth, and you'll see die back, and the crown eventually thin out and die. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do for either one of those. So uh, again, Diplodia, the newest growth is affected with pitch canker. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. With uh, Diplodia, the newest growth under the new candles, underneath the, the newest coat is affected. Uh, let me get how I organize this. So pitch canker, 
you'll see the growth uh, taking out the terminal. I'm sorry, and then Diplodia, it's the older growth, kind of older, but recent under the new flush of, of the candles. Anyway, there's nothing we can do about it other than sanitation, remove the infected trees. And hope the environment changes so the disease doesn't occur. So I had to throw this in there because uh, we're talking about slash pines, but as you recall, if you uh, watch the presentation on uh, pines that everybody gets in a panic when they see the sawdust and resin, but it, it's caused by a secondary uh, organism. These Ips beetles move into dying. Slash pines have been whipped around in storms and have internal injuries and are going to die anyway. And we did a uh, YouTube video on, on that as well. So don't spray those pesticides on the pines to control the bark beetles. It's not going to help. It's an abiotic environmental related issue. And here's a oak issue that just popped up uh, a month ago and we're getting crown dieback. And we had this about five years ago and we were associating it with uh, a disease. There's a, a diplodia tip dieback that affects oaks that had not been reported uh, until 2010. And we just see it sporadically and, and it showed up. We're not sure if it's that. Here's, here's the controversy looking at, is this caused by a disease or could it be caused by turf herbicide applications? Which coming up here, uh, Dr. Jason Smith with the plant pathology department has done research looking at some broadleaf common lawn broadleaf weed killers um, and found that if you used a certain dose it's okay usually if you use one application but if you come in with a little heavier application or two applications per year you can get this branch dieback and death of uh, oak trees So that's one that can be a fooler and we're still trying to sort out what happened at this one HOA association. Oh, I see what I did. So anyway, yeah, here's, here's the, going back to the pines, the Ips beetles do not kill South Florida slash pines. They're like buzzards on a road kill. Those pines are gonna die anyway. Another disease on a native plant, a red bay. And this is a uh, preserve area, actually it's somewhere on the East Coast, I'm not sure where, but all the brown purple images are dead red bay or laurel bay trees, which are killed by this, let's call it a systemic disease. Uh, ambrosia beetle drills into the tree and it carries a fungus with it. Let's see. So it kind of farms the fungus by in inoculating the tree with these spores that, as it tunnels into the vascular pipelines and into the phloem and cambium areas. So Supposedly it can attack sassafras a little further north. I'm not sure if that's happening. I hope not. That's one of my favorite trees. So we're also seeing death. I'd say almost all the red bays have been eliminated by this laurel wilt disease. Here's what symptoms look like. It's just a large area of the canopy browns out. Leaves do not drop off. So that's part of a, the diagnosing. And here's a, a giveaway clue that the, uh, as the ambro ambrosia beetles tunnel into the trunk, you'll see these sawdust 
fungal hyphae holding the sawdust together. So they're trying to clean out their tunnel areas by being tidy little ambrosia beetles. And uh, the, the sawdust sticks together unless you've had rain or wind. So if you see these like uh, cigarette ash type debris accumulate on the trunk, you know you've got the, uh, you're gonna have the laurel wilt disease showing up soon. And here's what it looks like on uh, avocados, unfortunately. This is a real issue to the avocado growers. Uh, so this is kind of dated information, but people don't realize how many avocado groves there are in uh, more of the uh, homestead area. So uh, we've been lo losing some, let's see if I put this other picture in here. Uh, it also spreads through root grafts. So some of these older avocado groves, many of the trees have been there so long that all their roots are interconnected. And so when one tree is, you know, not all the beetles spread the disease, they don't all carry the spores, but um, let me back up. There's also native beetles that are found, uh, I think four or five species of native beetles that can also carry the spores. Uh, so when they infect one tree, it can spread through the root system to other trees. That makes it uh, more deadly. And there's some links you might uh, take a look at later. All right, looking at annuals. People try to make those impatiens grow. Uh, oh, yeah, that was in the good old days, uh, 19. Not 19, maybe 19, but looking before uh, two, 2010 or so, maybe 2012. There's more information on this. We had uh, we got slammed with a downy mildew disease that took out. It was really weird. It was like nationwide, all the impatiens. So what they ended up looking like this. They also get some diseases if you let them go much more than six months. And this is what usually happens as far as a substitute, looking at New Guinea impatiens. I always ended up getting a uh, bacterial disease. I never had much luck with them, but uh, I'm low maintenance. Okay, here's uh, maybe there's some information coming up here on the other uh, impatiens. But the periwinkles, uh, everybody knows they like it dry and they like to be neglected. Uh, otherwise, we tend, I have done this, put them under the shade of the good old oak tree, and then uh, they get extra irrigation, extra rainfall, and they have this stem dieback disease. So here's the healthy tissue on the left, and then on the right, you can see the uh, fungal disease the di causing this dieback. And uh, here's the flat of periwinkles I, I bought and it was raining, so I put them under the old oak tree, and about a week later, they did this, so. Oh, I thought I was plugged in. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Sorry for that. Okay, so yeah, those periwinkles didn't make it. Okay, so looking at managing uh, diseases, strategy should be think preventive, don't let, let it get a foothold. So looking at uh, cultural practices as far as shade, sun, uh, irrigation frequencies, and then fungicides if needed. But you can't wait till the... Uh, Okay, let me see. Downing mildews are not fungi. I think that's coming up. So what do you have for references? Okay, you have um, several references. I'm gonna show those at the end, but unfortunately they aren't updated every year. And unfortunately we need more 
landscape woody ornamental plant pathologist to uh, keep us current. So different fungicides work different ways. Here's uh, looking at a fungal spore landing on, this is a, a leaf surface. So here's a brown spore and it sends in a, uh, a peg or penetration into the uh, palisade layer, through the palisade layer into the mesophyll and it's home, it's in the host. So it's uh, penetrated into the twig or leaf. And so as it develops, it, uh, is it, it'll eventually produce spores. And that's what these are here on the right. So different fungicides act at different points in the growth of the pathogen. So some fungicides, if it's on the surface of the leaf, it'll prevent that penetration peg from moving into the leaf. And some fungicides will even act after it's moved into the plant tissue. And you get a little systemic activity. Okay, so we're, we're moving on to palm diseases. So, uh, based on your experiences in the South Florida landscape, can you name three palm diseases? Just give a little doubt. Real fast. Okay, you can, uh, D Mike, anybody know a, a common palm disease? Lethal bronzing. Lethal bronzing, good. That's one that's moved in. Well, it's been in your area longer than our area. We'll talk about that. Any others? Okay, this will be a learning step. So looking at uh, some of the references we use, uh, Dr. Tim Broshot and Dr. Monica Elliott, who unfortunately were they've retired like three or four years ago but they i was i would bother them frequently because uh palms i think are kind of like turf and can be a little difficult to diagnose so that's one reference but if you know at least the common key diseases that's something that'll help you out so uh this is a queen palm affected by what else does the queen palm get Ganoderma butt rot and here's a king size conch, a, a prize winner at the uh, county fair, I think. The monster conch, or uh, they also call it a shelf fungus or a bracket fungus. Uh, so once you learn what to look for, remember we talked about uh, what's a healthy specimen look like? Well, here's a queen palm. It's frizzled, uh, tiny leaflets. The leaflets size is not anything to what a normal leaflet should be. The frond length is shortened, uh, they're drooping. It's a wilt symptom with this disease because Ganoderma butt rot means it's essentially clogged up the trunk here and there's no nutrients going up as well as uh, vascular pipelines in the palm are a little bit different than hardwoods. That disease is choking off the nutrients going down uh, into the root system. And uh, I've heard it, you could, heard it said that you can even wiggle uh, a, a queen palm until it's got Ganoderma butt rot because the roots are decaying. So, and what I noticed first is you'll see a healthy canopy, a normal canopy outline before it starts drooping and the leaflets and fronds will be a sort of a gray blue color. It'll go off color and then they wilt and get limp and uh, it's dead. And should you remove the sump, it's probably a good idea because it's like a shiitake fungus mushroom log and just keeps producing these bracket fungi which release spores and you're gonna leave uh, palms nearby at risk. So we have fact sheets on that and there's also, Stephen Brown's done, a, so I hate to shift people to Stephen Brown's YouTube channel, but yes, he's done some good uh, videos on Ganoderma butt rot and some other South Florida landscape issues. 
So palm lethal yellowing was a huge issue, especially on the East Coast, Miami, down to the Keys back in the 70s. And they call it lethal yellowing because anyway, with the Jamaican varieties of uh, coconuts, this organism, which is a, um, it's a mycoplasma type, which is essentially a wallless bacterium, is inoculated into the plant by a plant hopper. So this, is, this disease is vectored as is lethal bronzing, its cousin, by they think the same plant hopper. So it plugs up, the disease plugs up the vascular pipelines and it's a very rapid death within six, 12 months, that palm is dead. So symptoms with lethal yellowing are after the insect introduces the pathogen, the mycoplasma, the fronds start wilting and collapse like an umbrella. And with this coconut variety, they turn yellow. With uh, other palm species, such as Christmas palm and the uh, maypan and Malayan palms, it's more of a brown color. So it's not always lethal yellowing. And believe it or not, you actually get it on pandanus. It's cork, corkscrew spine will also get the cork, corkscrew pine, even though it's not pine, will get this uh, lethal yellowing disease. So symptoms to look for in this overlaps into the lethal bronzing disease are, as the new flowers open, you'll see this kind of brownish, blackish necrosis. So you have to catch them early just as they're opening. Here's, here's uh, the vector, the bad guy, and here's one flipped on his back. And you can see the mouth parts, the stylus, the sucking mouth parts. And remember, the immatures of this insect feed on grass roots, which makes it kind of interesting as far as management strategies, trying to get rid of the grass in these areas where the disease is developing. Another symptom is all the fruit or nuts, small, medium, large, will drop off uh, rather rapidly within a month or so. Small, medium, large, even though they're not ripe, they drop and they're stained. They have this kind of a oily water soaked stain where they were attached to the, uh, the brack, bracket of the flower inflorescence, should I say. Uh, here's uh, lethal yellowing symptoms on Christmas palm, so you can see a brownie. What can you do? Uh, you have to do, and this kind of surprised me coming down from Ohio, and they're injecting antibiotics into palm trees. It's like, oh, that explains what all those uh, golf tees were doing in the, inserted in the trunks of palms. You know, when you vacation down here, you may have seen that. Well, that's to hold in the uh, oxytetracycline, the antibiotic that's injected into the palm trunks. Now they're, they're a little more sophisticated using these bullet casings. There's a uh, rubber septa at the end. They insert the needle through after they uh, have drilled the hole and put the casing in the trunk, and that holds the solution in a whole lot better. So you have to do this uh, two or three times a year, and it will prevent the little bacteriums from reproducing and growing. So Texas Phoenix palm decline moved into your area probably about 10 years ago. I think P Pinellas Manatee, Hillsboro uh, just showed up last year in our area. So that's, I'm surprised it's been so slow, but most of those have probably been from um, new landscapes where they brought in palms from infected areas. So, and this is tough to diagnose. So. Uh, you diagnostician, so cabbage palms are usually a little messy looking, if you will, and they have this dead row of palm fronds. And then with the disease, you have this subtle bronze row, and then the spear leaf dies, and then the rest of the canopy dies. So it's gonna be kind of tough to diagnose. Some people keep them pruned up and, uh, 
remove any discolored fronds, so that makes it even tougher. So, and you see this uh, flower. So if, if you see a lot of premature fruit drop, even with cabbage palms, that's indicative of the disease. We're also seeing sylvester palms and pygmy date palms dying from this disease. So yeah, it used to be called Texas Phoenix Palm Decline, but uh, out of courtesy to our Texas plant pathologist, we changed it to uh, lethal bronzing disease, but I still call it TPPD or Texas Phoenix Palm Decline. Lethal bronzing disease is the uh, uh, politically correct name for it now. Okay, and, and here's from uh, public, there's an excellent publication by uh, Dr. Bader, uh, who also has classes once in a while, annually, on this disease. So you can see 2008, it was in your area, and then uh, it's just showing up in our area. And at first I was panicked by the fact that it's killing cabbage palms, which, let me backtrack to palm lethal yellowing. Palm lethal yellowing disease did not kill our native palms. It was more the coconuts and uh, Christmas palms and it, any other palm almost, except our native palm. So we get this mutant strain, this cousin to the palm lethal yellowing disease, and it does kill our native cabbage palm. And uh, Brian, Dr. Batters, brought up the point, you know, I was seeing all of our cabbage palms throughout the land, through all our preserves and natural areas dying, but you gotta keep in mind, you have to have the hosts or the immatures of the vector, which you don't normally see, St. Augustine grass, and there are other grasses that will develop on in these native areas, so that, that's a good thing that may be slowing its uh, spread. Let's see, I've got about three more diseases. I think I can wrap up here and uh, we'll call it a day for plant pathology. If you want to hang in there. So uh, Fusarium wilt, uh, unlike Ganoderma being a wilt disease, but with Fusarium, it doesn't wilt. They kind of just go like freeze dried and this is spread with pruning tools, whereas the other diseases that I've talked about, the other palm diseases are not. So Ganoderma isn't spread by pruning uh, tools or mechanical means, and, and neither is uh, lethal bronzing disease, thankfully. But Fusarium wilt is uh, very easy to spread with your pruning tools. Another symptom that that disease has occurred is this black brown stripe down the rachis, down the petiole. You'll see it on the outside as well as the inside. Uh, this isn't real common, but we'll see uh, Thulaviopsis trunk rot uh, on palms that are stressed. It's more common on coconuts after a cold winter, and it can attack anywhere along the trunk. And it dissolves the connective tissue. It's a fungus that dissolves the connective tissue in the palm trunk and eventually it, it collapses. And again, it's highly, highly contagious with the pruning tools. And uh, once you cut this down, it's very characteristic that uh, all those vascular bundles look like uh, spaghetti before you cook it and uh, just looks like straws or dry spaghetti before you cook it it's very uh, characteristic and also I'm, I've stopped taking samples and putting them in my car because they smell so bad from uh, the decay of the uh, the carbohydrates in the trunk so you get a yeasty alcohol smell that's another symptom And sometimes you'll get a leaking of a, a dark red, black ooze from the portal of entry where, the, where it's entered the trunk. 
Okay, so Thalaviopsis is not so common. One that I bet you'll find on every Phoenix canar canariensis or uh, Dactylifera is uh, what many people have mistaken for a mealybug or scale insect. If you check the lower fronds of your Canary Island date palms and the, the true date palms, you'll see these cool looking fungal structures. If you look close, it's, it's like a chimney and these threads are releasing the spores. And I kind of like that one. So uh, check the bottom fronds, the lower fronds on these phoenix palms. And uh, some of this grain or discoloration is due to what's a big issue with palms as far as nutrients go? Potassium deficiency. So some of this is potassium deficiency and some of it's due to uh, the, the graffiola, I forgot to introduce it, graffiola false smut. And I'm not seeing any research done on trying to control it. It's one that shows up late in the season, October, November. So fungicides might work. These fronds are supposed to live eight, eight years, some of them, depending on the variety. So the way with our environment down here, we have uh, 60 inches of rainfall and these palms are more adapted to what? Six inches of rainfall. Uh, we're gonna have more diseases and especially this graffiola false smut. All right, so what do you have as far as references? There's individual fact sheets on some of these diseases as well as uh, Dr. Phil Harmon. Uh, unfortunately, Aaron Palmentier has moved on to a different position outside the university. He was an awesome plant pathologist. Phil's awesome. Uh, he's mostly turf, but uh, this is one handout you should have at the plant clinic. They talk about the different diseases. I think they've updated it, and it's like 12 pages now. I list almost every fungicide. And here's an old time reference I really recommend. I'm not, it might be out of print. Uh, it's SP 235. You can try the University of Florida book store. Ralph might have some copies laying around. It's more for nurseries. And here's what I like about it. It has key plants. Say you're on the, uh, on the phone at the plant clinic and somebody calls in You've got the key plants, you've got the key diseases, key insects and mites, and also key nematodes. I mean, this is an awesome reference. It's just about 15 years out of date, unfortunately, and we get a new pest at least every year. So there's some pests I need to add to this, but it's a great background reference. Say you're a Mexican heather, the kufia, somebody's showing you samples, uh, whether it's a picture, a virtual picture, virtual sample. Um, you know, you're, you're on the hot spot and they're asking you, and it's like, gosh, I can't remember all the problems with every plant. Well, here's your, your backup. You've got uh, root rots, flea beetles. Here's other things to consider, uh, ne nematodes. So this is a, a huge help in the diagnostic process, and uh, it's a gold mine. And so some of this information's also out there. I have to get my affirmative action statement in there, Ralph, okay? So uh, as Ralph said, I'll be retiring in July, uh, but the YouTube videos are out there. I'm trying to hit a million hits uh, in two months. I'm at uh, 600,000, somewhere in there. So you gotta step it up, guys. I gotta make a million hits. Um, and it's good information on the different diseases and insects. Each video is like six to eight minutes, so it's we try to keep them short. Okay, I think that's the last slide there. That's why it's not moving.